in past lives, I used to work at the Arboretum and I worked at the Museum of Northern Arizona. And how I got interested over 20 years ago in mushroom hunting is I volunteered to be the driver for a day trip that the um, museum was doing. And I don't know if any of you know uh, Mary Lou Fairweather and um, Ed, what's Ed's last name? Smith? Ed Smith, and uh, he worked for the Nature Conservancy and she worked for the Forest Service and they were, it wasn't their profession, but they were just really avid mushroom hunters and they liked to share their knowledge. And so we initially learned from them. And then when I worked at the Arboretum, I hosted a weekend mushroom retreat for several years. And we would do forays out at Hart Prairie Preserve. And we chose that location because a lot of the mushrooms we're gonna look at, they're associated with specific trees. So if you're in a place where you have a lot of diversity of tree species, you're going to see different mushrooms that grow with them. So like I live out in Kachina and I'm just gonna see the mushrooms that like to um, live their mycelium, live off the roots of ponderosa pine trees. But luckily, a lot of the ones we really like to eat and collect um, like the ponderosa pine forest. So um, I know that we have a whole diversity of people here. Some people are brand new. Raise your hand if you're like brand new, maybe you know one or two species, okay. And then ones who've been mushroom hunting for years. So we got just a few of those, okay. So I'm gonna be talking more towards the beginning level and my program today is going to focus on yummy ones we can eat and ones that'll kill us and not a lot of the ones in between <laughs> because there's so many different species. But I do encourage you to get, there are several books, if you're, if you're gonna get only two books Mushrooms and Truffles of the Southwest by Jack States was written, he was a biology professor at NAU and it was written specifically for our area. So for example, I always wanted to find morels. We don't get a lot of morels here, but in some years when we do, we get a lot. And so I, re I read this like a novel, like at night when I was in bed, you know, I would read every chapter of it. And one day I just woke up in the spring and we had had a warm, wet spring. And I said, I think that we might have morels this year. And I, and I looked in the book and it said that they, you could find them around aspens and um, between 8,000 and 10,000 feet in the leaf litter. And we got in the truck and we went up to, I'm not gonna tell you exactly where, because that, that's the thing, it's sort of like, you know, you don't bring up certain subjects, you know, religion, politics, with a mushroom hunter, you don't ask, where did you find it? The answer will be, you know, on the San Francisco pe peaks between 8,000 and 10,000 feet. <laughs> so they will never tell you specifically their mushroom spot unless they're in love with you. So um, we went to, the area where I thought they were gonna be, and lo and behold, in the leaf litter, with a little bit of snow melting, there were just morels, morels, morels. But maybe we have a year like that once every five to seven years. Would you agree with that? Yes. So, uh, but also if we've had a burn, so like down at the end of Woody Mountain Road where the pocket is, where the fire came up from Oak Creek, there were some morels that came up after the burn over there. Well, um, and the other one I wanna recommend, and uh, David Aurora, who is based in California, and he does a lot of programs. Telluride has an amazing mushroom festival, so if you really get into this and you wanna learn more, you might wanna attend the Telluride Mushroom Festival. But this is a wonderful book. This is his pocket guide called All That the Rain Promises and More, and it's just a really fun book, and you can, look through it later, but it, it has um, keys. So when you find a mushroom, you can key it out, you know, doing a, a dichotomous key. So you're gonna be looking for things like the cap color, what kind of gills it has, what color is the stem, um, does it have, is it in a, growing out of a cup underground? You're always gonna to wanna to have a knife with you when you're out mushroom hunting. And you know, it's not just cute, to have a basket, there's a reason for it. 
So you don't want to carry a lot of dirt with you. Some people, like Nancy, uh, carries a brush. Uh, I usually just wipe it on my pants, but um, you can you know, brush off. If it's a delicate mushroom, probably brushing it is better than wiping it on your pants. And it helps you to see the true color to key it out. And when you're walking along, the dirt will, and bugs will fall out. And also, you don't, if you have them in a bag, they're kind of banging up against each other, and you don't want to um, injure them. So if you're walking along, uh, if they're Americans, they'll say, oh, are you having a picnic? If they're Germans, they'll say, is there good mushroom hunting around here? <laughs> so, <laughs> anyhow, we'll get started. And um, this is an example of, we do have some Caesar's Amanitas here, and um, I made a spaghetti sauce with these Caesar's Amanitas. They're not normally super shiny like that. Those had just been washed. Some of the easy ones and the earliest ones to come out, and um, folks here said they found some oysters on bear jaw, a bear jaw abanel. A lot of times they like to grow on cork bark fur, and you'll see them growing in shelves like this on downed logs. And uh, I have an example. So you'll see them growing in groups, shelf-like, on dead trees. And the cap can be white to gray. Even some have found pink, beige. The gills will be white, and they run down the stalk. So they'll go all the way down the stalk. They're not going to stop at a specific point. And the, if there's not always a stalk, but if there is a stalk, then everything is growing kind of off center, kind of like an ear. And um, you'll see them growing in groups and masses. Now, the one thing that a lot of people don't like about oyster mushrooms, they can be really buggy. So the flies get to them quickly, and they'll lay their larva in there. If you don't like maggots, mushroom hunting is not for you. <laughs> so when you get home, I recommend putting them in the sink with water. And Nancy suggested putting some salt in the water, too. And so the bugs will try to get out of the um, oyster mushrooms in the water. Maybe rinse it again if you don't want your, uh, what you're making to be too salty. I don't find that they preserve well. So, so that's one of the things is when you're out hunting, keep in mind like you don't want to get massive amounts of them if you're not going to eat them right away. Because these, I would say the only way, and people can chime in if they have another way of preserving them. I would. If I had a lot, I'd saute them up and then maybe freeze the sauteed mushrooms. But the best thing would be to put them in a recipe right away. And something like a stir fry would be ideal for oyster mushrooms. Um, OK, now this is sort of the holy grail around here. And I know that some people have said that we have a different species here. I don't know if it's been accepted by the scientific community yet. But around the world, <laughs> where it's known as king bolete and boletus edulis, but then I know that the one that we have is rubiceps. And has that been accepted in scientific circles? OK. So you'll hear it. And I recommend, if you're getting into this and you're on Facebook, there is an Arizona Mushroom Society. And you can like their page. And what's nice about it is that people will put a picture and say, hey, I found Boletus rubiceps. Sometimes they'll just call them rubies. And they'll say, oh, I found them near Williams. So at least it gives you like, hey, like we better get out there soon. They're popping. So I don't have any examples of um, edulis or rubiceps here. Um, but I do have their cousin, Barosii. And um, the main difference between them, the, the edulis, um, point to it here. It's going to have this sort of brick red cap to it. Um, there are no gills. It's a sponge on the bottom. And it'll have a thick stalk that's white to brown. It's usually kind of bulbous at the bottom. Grows under conifers. And it should be popping right about now, which is three weeks after the rains begin. Now, a lot of people get them confused with Sewillus. And we brought some examples of Sewillus in. That also has pores or a sponge underneath. But the main thing, Sewillus is also um, referred to, oh, I just forgot that, Slippery Jack. Slippery Jack is the name of it. And it's really, when it's wet, 
It's really slimy and it grows under pine, so pine needles are usually stuck on the cap. So when we're hiking along and I think I found a barosiae, but I see pine needles stuck in it, I'm 90% sure it's a sewillus. And uh, we can, I mean, if you don't mind passing, are you okay passing it around? Okay. <laughs> um, you'll see it, ha it has the sponge underneath, but the stem is narrow. It, it doesn't get bulbous at the bottom like you see in the picture here. So, it can be many different colors. So the one I'm passing around is kind of um, similar to the aspen bolete here, which also is kind of a brick red but there's another Sewillus that's brown. There are many different spe subspecies of them. Uh, the ones you see most often are kind of a beige or yellowish beige, but there, there's lots of different colors of Sewillus, but they're always slimy. <laughs> and some people eat them. They'll peel off the slimy top and then they'll you know, slice it up and remove all the tubes. And then supposedly the mushroom, I mean, it's edible, but they say it's insipid, so it doesn't, I don't know, do you eat them, Fred? No. Sure. It's like, come on, there's other good things to eat out there. <laughs> but it, it, it has the consistency of snails. So I would say if you're having, if you were serving snails, Nicole, who's French, who serves snails, and you have a, a uh, vegetarian coming over, <laughs> you could make a few vegetarian ones with um, the Sewillus. Does it absorb the butter or whatever? Yeah, and it, uh, yeah, it would absorb the garlic and butter, so that it would be probably delicious with the garlic and butter. So there we go. We can serve vegetarian snails. Okay, so this is what um, I was very happy that Nancy found some excellent examples of the barosia. Are you okay with me passing yeah. it around? Okay. She's planning to slice it up and dry. <laughs> yeah, that... Yeah, so that one is also delectable. And um, I have, what happened to the dried ones? I don't know where the, oh, I have them over here. I'll pass around the, the dried ones. So this, the barosii that we're passing around, that's it, dried. And um, you want it to be really firm to the touch. and you'll cut into it, and if it has a few larva holes in it, it should be fine. And like Fred was saying, that when you dehydrate it, all the little bugs will fall to the bottom of your dehydrator. I say, if you're also worried that there could be some maggots in there, just serve it over rice with a little bit of pepper and nobody <laughs> will know. <laughs> you like that one, Larry. <laughs> okay, so... Um, going to have a white cap, no gills, I have a sponge underneath, thick stalk, whitish, the stalk should be at least an inch in diameter, uh, not diameter, uh, yeah, across. Um, you'll find it under conifers, mostly ponderosa pine, but you can find it at higher elevations, and it tends to grow in groups. So Nancy was telling me earlier that when they found one they stopped and looked around because they were looking for shrumps. Those are mushroom humps where the, um, the needles are raised up. And a lot of times people will go mushroom hunting with a walking stick. So you don't have to bend over all the time to move the shrimp out of the way. And that's where you find, is that where you found the really good ones? They, were, they had just popped up and they were under little shrimp. And, um, yeah, so when you cut the stem off, you can see if it's totally riddled with uh, larva or um, if it's looking pretty good. Sometimes you can just cut the stem off and the cap is okay. So uh, barosii is one that I would recommend. So I always get upset when it's like pouring on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and I got to work until Friday, and then it stops. And I'm like, oh no, everything's going to be full of worms by the time I get out there you know, on, Friday, on Saturday or Sunday. So you kind of want to go right after. And you don't want them hanging around. You, like, you want to process them right when you get home 
or like within a day. Slice them up as thin as you can and um, either put them in a dehydrator. We have kind of a two-step process. So my husband, Bob, will uh, put a big screen in the basement with a fan under it just to like start the drying process and then we kind of keep the dehydrator going all night to get them totally with no moisture left and then we'll bag them up. Okay, aspen bolites, and we have some examples. I'm, I'm not gonna pass those around. They're, they're starting to turn, they're kind of soft. But uh, they, what's kind of unusual about them, the, the cap is kind of this orange brown um, it also has the spongy pores on the bottom. The, the stalk um, has this scaly look to it. And um, it can be, this one's fairly narrow, but about an inch, and you'll find it exclusively under aspens. And when you cut into it, it'll turn sort of a purplish gray immediately, but that's fine. The one thing is when you slice it and dehydrate it, it's gonna turn black. And it's delicious, it'll be dried black. So you might wanna think of the recipes of what you're gonna put it in, because it could make stuff look sorta of ugly. But if you had like a deep brown gravy, having a little black mushroom in it uh, wouldn't, wouldn't be off-putting. Okay, chanterelles, we don't have them so much around here. I have found some, but when I've gone up to Colorado, like around Telluride, Montrose, we've just found them carpeting the ground. And um, they, they grow in clusters. A lot of times you'll find them around rocks. And uh, I have found them high up about uh, 9,000 to 10,000 feet on the peaks. And um, the cap is a bright orange yellow. The gills are not, so they have blunt edges, kind of like the veins on your arm if you had really muscular arms. And um, they kind of branch out the veins on them and the, they're, the gills are gonna be the exact same color as the cap and the, one of the main things, if you do cut one and you smell it, it smells like apricots. And um, I think I have mostly found that associated with like Douglas fir or cork bark fir. Have you found much in the way of uh, chanterelles? Oh, okay, I have found them under Gamble Oak once, but I don't, I don't have a regular spot. Yeah. And we found some last year up on the, in the White Mountains, more towards the first. First, okay. Yeah, I've, I've continued to look under oaks since I did find them around Gamble Oaks, but I think that was a really wet year, but uh, since then I've only, but only a few. But when I went to Montrose, Colorado, they were just like a carpet of them amongst rocks with um, lichen on them. Okay, so this is the most ubiquitous mushroom. Like if you're gonna start out mushroom hunting, um, this is a good one to start with. I know some people from California have been leery of this, and so I should make a little side note, is when you get to know the mushrooms of your area, you are only an expert in your geographic area. If you go to travel someplace else and you see something that's okay to eat in your neck of the woods, it might not be okay over there. Like I know when I worked at the Arboretum, sometimes there would be Russian ladies who would go and they're picking all the rusulas. Well, we have, um, and I don't, I don't know if I have, I might have a picture of a rusula later on. I, I think that in Poland and Russia, Theirs are like, you know, that's fine to eat, but we have so many different subspecies. We don't have any rusulas that'll kill you, but we have a lot that will make you sick. So with the lobster mushroom, what you have going on here is you have a edible, but not delicious white mushroom that is um, brevipes. Forget the first part of it. 
Russula brevipes. So it's this conical white mushroom that you wouldn't want to eat it until it gets attacked by this orange parasite. So I guess in California, there are some poisonous mushrooms get, that get attacked by a parasite that look like the lobsters. As far as I know, we have never, I've never encountered anyone who has found a poisonous mushroom attacked uh, to look like this. So it's always gonna have this concave shape to it. And the ones that are good to eat, they should be very firm, like styrofoam and white, pure white. If they're starting to grow gray, become gray inside, chuck it. You'll find a lot more of them, so don't hold on to that one. So yeah, David Aurora, as I mentioned, he's the author. Uh, this is pretty much the Bible. So this is like the scientific book that has real scientific dichotomous keys. And this one is his little fun book. I get the impression he has a really good sense of humor. Am I right? Yes. OK. So this you'll enjoy reading. Um, and oh, these are pages from his book. So there's little um, explanations and asides. And it shows you right here, this, this is what the Rusula brevipes looks like before it's attacked by the parasite. And then it becomes delicious. To some, some people aren't crazy about it. Um, I find it's best cooked fresh, and I would only saute it and freeze the sauteed rather than, I think it was pretty awful when it was dehydrated and reconstituted. Would you agree with that, Fred? Okay. Yeah, I was like, no, nah, I'm not going to bother dehydrating those. It, it just became very leathery and did not, you know, uh, reconstitute. Okay. So, oh, when I say white, white inside, white inside. So, like I said, you're you're out there hunting. You've got your knife, and you're gonna cut it off at the base. And you can kind of tell right away when you cut. And a lot of times they've got dirt inside the top of them, and there there's a lot of dirt there, and. Uh, so you cut it off at the base. If that looks pure white, then it might be worth collecting. If you start to see gray or brown in there, then don't bother. And it should feel really firm. And um, so a lot of people, you know, like maybe when you were helping your mom in the kitchen, she said, don't put the mushrooms under water. It's going to soak up all the water. Those mushrooms from the store were never, they never came in contact with the rain. And uh, they will soak it up like a sponge, probably won't taste good in your uh, sponge salad. But these are so filthy. You're going to want to go home and, you know, get the sprayer in your sink and just hose those things down. And I even use the scrubber on them. And, you know, you just don't want to be eating the dirt. So don't worry about this, these wild mushrooms, getting them wet if you want to wash them. They were just out in the rain. <laughs> so um, don't worry about that. OK. Yeah, so you're not going to see gills. The gills have been sort of eaten up by this parasite. You want the white flesh. And they're going to be under shrumps. So if you see some orange poking out here and there, and you see a lobster, Maybe that one's a little dried out and old, but look for those lumps where you're going to find other ones. OK. Now this Caesar's Amanita. This one we collected for several years before we decided that we were confident enough to eat it. Because most of the other mushrooms in the, the Amanita family are poisonous. Um, some poisonous to a hallucinogenic way, but not a fun way, like throwing up and you're in the psych ward at the emergency room. So um, yeah, so we'll look at some pictures of those. And then there are some amanitas that are deadly that will destroy your liver. So this one we heard was really good to eat. And we have a lot of them growing around Flagstaff. And when you start to see them, that usually means the bolites are coming up as well. Now, one of the main things is this beautiful orange color. And 
These amanitas, they grow like an egg, and there's a veil, they sort of pop through the veil, and it'll have a, sometimes it'll still have a piece of the veil on top of it. So you can see here where it's kind of popping out of its egg, and they very distinctively have an orange cap. If it's been sitting out in the rain, that's going to fade. It will be a light orange. It should be bald with just a white patch, not little warts. The gills should be bright yellow. The stalk is rather thick, and it's not swollen at the base. They grow in groups in, under pine trees, and you do not want to confuse it with Amanita muscaria, which, depending if it's been out for a while, it can look really similar. So if it's been in the rain, it can fade. So this used to be that orange that you see there, but it's been out in the rain. And this is a muscaria that might have been bright red, but it's been out in the rain, and so it's starting to look orange. So they look really similar. But if you look at the gills, do you see a big difference here? White. Yes. So the one that is okay to eat has orange gills, yellow orange gills, and the one that'll make you ill or psychotic <laughs> has white gills. Now, supposedly, this is the whole Santa Claus and flying reindeers come from that. You can Google it. I'm not going to get into it. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> so um, now, after we were so excited, we were finally you know, confident enough to eat these. We're not really that crazy about them. They're fishy. So, um, and I have one that's rotting there that's really smelling like fish. And uh, I make a risotto with uh, shrimp that I'll put that in. And so that's a nice compliment since the, the mushrooms are kind of fishy themselves. Okay, so that's what the, um, the other one, the Amanita muscaria or fly agaric, that's what it looks like. And we get excited when we see those because we usually see um, the boletes, the king boletes or uh, rubies around the same places where these are growing up. And they're just so beautiful. I think they're the most beautiful mushrooms. So that one <clears throat> has a bright red to orange cap with scattered with warts, white gills, white stalk. It's going to be bulbous at the bottom. And they're found in groups. Uh, pine, spruce, and it refers to it as toxic. Now, supposedly, reindeer eat those, and then people like shaman in uh, Lapland will gather the urine from the reindeer have eaten them, and then that will get you high. But you know what? That's too much work. <laughs> so. Okay, death cap. So these are another couple of amanitas, and I didn't collect any. Did you see any when you were out there? This one here? That's kind of yellowish. Okay, so folks can come down here. And Nancy did a nice job of trying to uh, keep the, the bottom of the, it's referred to as a vulva, intact. Okay, cap pale green, greenish yellow or olive brown, fading to tan or paler with age. Gills are white in all of the stages, has a sac at the base of the stalk, found in groups in forests, under trees, deadly, a single mushroom can be fatal. Now, I've heard stories of Italians in California who were trying to collect, they like um, in a salad, when they're in the egg stage, um, I think it's called ovoli salad, and so they have mistaken this for a mushroom that they're familiar with back in Italy. So that's an example of if you're, you know, in a totally different continent, don't be too confident with your mushroom hunting skills. Destroying angel. So that's another amanita that will kill you. Maybe not immediately, but it'll, I guess it starts to liquefy your liver. The cap is pure white, white on the edges, gills and stalk are white, sac or cup at the base, always 
growing near trees, especially oak, and it's deadly poisonous. So, and oh, okay, yeah, and so you know, a lot of times, well, I've had questions like, if animals can eat it, can we? You know, I saw a deer eat it, I saw a squirrel eat it. No, <laughs> just because they're eating it. And who knows if they're still alive after they took a bite out of it. But there are some that deers and squirrels eat that just aren't tasty for us. Um, so I wouldn't, yeah, and if something smells bad, it probably is not going to taste good. But we have an example of this foliota here that smells really good. It smells like garlic, and supposedly Basque sheep herders ate it. But it... Um, in David Aurora's books, it says it causes gastrointestinal problems. So I'll just eat, I'll stick with the garlic and the, the regular mushrooms. Okay, so I'll just quickly mention some other common mushrooms. Um, these cap ones over here, they're not, they're, we don't collect them to eat them, but they're fun, especially if you have kids around or you adults you want to amuse if, yeah that's a cup fungus so if you go up really close to it and you blow on it right in there and move away it'll take a second and then the spores will make like a puff of smoke you know it'll be like a delayed reaction it'll just like shoot out its spores so it's like fun with mushrooms and I say, if you can bring a kid with you, they're lower to the ground, <laughs> so they see more stuff, and uh, it's fun. It's like going on an Easter egg hunt. Oh, this isn't the greatest picture, but these are wood ears. So I don't know if anyone has ever had um, Chinese food that has wood ears in it. They're supposed to have really good medicinal properties, and um, they're usually growing, it's like you see the back of the ear from the top, and you'll, this is on cork bark fir, on down trees, and I, I'll tell you exactly where I found a lot of these, is on the Humphreys Trail, where when you first start it, you see so many um, dead, you know, fallen over cork bark firs and spruce, and so there, you'll see them on the, the logs, and um, you want them to be pretty firm. They, they can get really jelly-like if they're gooey. They're no good anymore. Um, in a real hot and sour soup, there's usually sliced up wood ear in there. It's kind of has a jelly-like texture. That's very good. Rusulas. So this is what I was saying before that a lot of Polish and Russians will go out in the woods and they'll just go crazy over the rusulas. Um, there, there are many different species. I recommend looking in all that the rain promises and more. There is one in particular whose name is Rusula emetica. So you can tell from the name that it is going to make you throw up. So you really need to know how to key that out. And even the ones that are edible, they're not considered to be that delicious. I know that a lot of Polish people, they'll pickle them. So um, they can have them. I'm not interested in collecting them myself. But I guess if I had a good recipe, it might, might be good. Okay, so uh, there, and I have examples of coral fungus here. And they're pretty cool to look at. They look like coral from under the sea. Um, it is, it has been reported that they will cause, um, they have a laxative effect. So... I'll just leave those in the woods. And, uh, and then this one here that's a, a little, is that a club coral? That's uh, considered to be sweet. I've never eaten it. Have you eaten it, Fred? Okay. Is it good? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know how you... <laughs> I don't know how you prepare them. Okay. Okay. Well, we have found them, but we've never eaten them. 
But I'm not a dessert person anyway, so. Okay, and then, oh, this is when I was in uh, Colorado, and those are all, it's not a great picture, but those are all chanterelles. There are a lot of chanterelles to be had. So it's a fun thing. It's hard when you're traveling, if you're just in a hotel room, and you're out, and you're like, ah, there's all these mushrooms, but I can't do anything with them. So get yourself an Airbnb <laughs> if you're going to go mushroom hunting where you've got a kitchen. And, um, you know, as I said, you could just soak them, hose them down, make sure you get the bugs out of them, get the dirt off of them. And chanterelles uh, dry pretty well also. So this is step one of our dehydrating process, just, just to make them smaller so we can fit more in the dehydrator. People also pickle mushrooms. Um, I've, I've seen people jar them in oil. I haven't eaten the mushrooms. I think that would be more of like a, an Italian way of doing it. And then freezing. I would usually saute first and then freeze. And then you can add them to recipes later. And um, that's pretty much what I have for the presentation. And I recommend that you, you know, get yourself some guidebooks and just get comfortable with a few species. Maybe, you know, follow the um, Arizona Mushroom. There's the Arizona Mushroom Society page, and then there's the Arizona Mushroom Forum, which I think is part of their, what they put out there. And so um, there are people who will, like, take a picture and then put it up there and say, identify, please. So that is pretty hard <laughs> and because uh, there's so many things you have to look at and also I have had people send me a text message with a picture and say is this good I'm about to eat it and it's like you know a deadly amanita and I don't have them in my contacts and I'm like calling them like who are you don't do it <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know just Get to the point where you're really comfortable and you've keyed everything out and, um, and start with, of course, the, the lobsters are pretty obvious. I think the boletes, you know, if you, the only thing that you might confuse them with is the sewillus, which isn't going to kill you, but if it's spongy and slimy, then it's probably the sewillus and not the bolete. Um, and then little by little, you can expand your repertoire. You'll see if, when you come down here, I have a lot of things that I've flagged in my book that I haven't even mentioned to you. Like one that we always look for this time of year is a cauliflower mushroom, and those are really amazing. So hopefully you'll get confident with a few species, and as you collect stuff, take it home, key it out, then you can keep building your repertoire. So, yeah. Are you saying anything about any groups here in Florida School? Well, the, the Arboretum has continued to uh, put on some mushroom programs. So I would go on the Arboretum site. But uh, like the Arizona Mushroom Society that's based in Phoenix, they do come up to Flagstaff for their yes. forays. And that was one of the first ones that Ed Smith had said to us, oh, shaggy manes, you can't confuse them for anything else. We had a conversation about shaggy manes earlier. And they usually grow along the side of the road and they have kind of a conical shape and they're a little bit like scrofulous looking. They tend to be really dirty because they like to grow in disturbed areas. You know, they'll come up out of gravel or sand and it's really hard to clean them. And then you gotta cook them right away because they will start to putrefy and get all inky. And they're in the same family with inky caps so inky caps have some chemical properties that interact with alcohol. So if you're making something like a spaghetti sauce and then you want to have a glass of wine with it, you could end up with an upset stomach. So I'm not a big fan of shaggy manes. They are, you know, pretty easy to identify. Like there's some things they're, they're good to eat or the flavor is pretty good. Like I haven't talked, I haven't talked about, I mean, there's so many different species. Agaricus. So agaricus is the species that uh, portobello mushrooms and uh, champi champignon de Paris, you know, the little white mushroom, button mushrooms you buy at the grocery store. Those grow out in nature, but 
They're also related to other agaricus mushrooms that will make you sick. And so um, Ed Smith that we learned from, he said, I mean, he has found some out in the wild and said they were really delicious. But he said, if it's the same as the one in the grocery store, and I know the one in the grocery store is good to eat, then I'm not going to risk, uh, you know, those won't kill you, but they will make you violently ill. If you, They call them the lose your lunch bunch. And he's got some really <laughs> lovely, fun pictures about that. Yeah. And oh, I, and I should mention that morels, they come up in the spring. So most everything that I've talked about, I didn't even mention morels because I was focusing on monsoon mushrooms. But uh, yeah, they have a very distinctive shape to them and they come up in the spring as the snow is melting. So any other questions? And then I invite folks to come down and look, yeah. What's your favorite to eat? Well, I would say the best are the, oh, it seems like maybe some things have ended up back there. Yeah, like the ones that are dried, because the, the bolites, um, the fact that you get a whole bunch of them and you can process them and dry them, hello, and keep them for years, and they're just, they're just so delicious. And like I said, that, that is the same thing as porcini, or if you're German, they're Steinpils. So there's just, they're, they're very well loved throughout the world. And I mean, I can take something like a pork chop and then just make an amazing sauce by throwing in some uh, of the dried porcini. So, you know, just sauteing it in the pan and then reconstituting a bunch of the dried, you know, crushed up. So you don't have to worry about slicing them so perfectly because you're probably gonna end up crushing them anyway when you make your sauce and then just kind of reconstituting it and maybe with some sour cream, salt and pepper. And then you got this amazing sauce with the pork chops. So I love those, yes. And what I was starting to say earlier, if you are gonna send somebody a picture, like put something in for scale. Make sure it's like a really high quality picture that you send them. You know, maybe they're opening it up on their computer, not just on their phone. Yeah, so if you send it as a text, they're not gonna be able to open it up on their computer. Um, but you know, make, I would say like an etiquette, if you did want to put it up on the mushroom forum, people seem to appreciate it better. If you tried to make an effort yourself first to identify it and say, I keyed this out and I think it's a blah, blah, blah. Can you confirm that for me? And maybe you get a picture from the top and a picture from the bottom, but yeah, like anything, if you if you made a, a little bit of an effort on your end. People are pretty good about chiming in, saying, yeah, that's, you know, and, and make note of where you found it. So, you know, like uh, if you said, I found it on such and such a kind of a tree or under that tree. So you'll provide people with that information. Yes. Well, I definitely don't. Uh, pick the ones that are deadly poisonous and carry them around. Oh, and that's a, a really good question that you have there. So if you did want to collect a whole bunch of stuff to take home and key out, bring some paper bags. So like these little lunch bags that Nancy brought. I just have like little bookman's bags or whatever. You might want to sequester the ones that you're that are questionable. So like I might have my good mushrooms to eat in here, and then my, oh, I feel like keying out these questionable ones in the bag. And I like the paper bag, number one, because like sometimes people will bring me stuff that's in plastic. It is giving off moisture and it's deteriorating really fast. So it might be hard by the time you get home, you won't be able to tell the color or anything anymore because it's already started to deteriorate. The paper bag soaks up the moisture. And then if you don't have time that night, maybe you did on a Saturday, you headed to a party, you feel like checking it out the next day, put it in the fridge, close it up so your spores don't get all over your fridge. But keep it in the paper bag in the fridge and then it'll stay pretty fresh for the next day when you can key it out. Yeah. Oh, that is, that is, I did not even talk about spore prints, but when you're keying stuff out, that is one of the characteristics you're looking for the color of the spores, especially with the agaricus, because there are, like, I've seen beautiful agaricus coming up in my yard, and I, 
Oh, when you're doing your spore print, I recommend putting it on a magazine. Because if you put it on white paper and the spores are white, you're not going to see anything. <laughs> and if you put it on dark paper and the spores are dark, so if you get a, a magazine or a newspaper, then you'll be able to see, are they brown, are they white, are they green? So um, the agaricus that usually comes up in our front yard, it drops green spores when I do a print. So you cut off the stalk and leave it overnight on the paper. And the green ones are definitely the, like when they say green around the gills, those are the ones that make you uh, upset, like vomit, yeah. So I, I recommend uh, that if you have questions, you want to look at some other mushrooms we have here. There's even bract fungus to come on down. And we have some people here who, like Nicole and Bob and uh, Nancy who offered to answer questions. Sounds like Fred might be able to answer some questions too. If you want to, and if there was, this is not, but people use it, they call it an artist's conch and you can kind of like, inscribe things in it and it dries and yeah it kind of make designs in it yeah and if if things ended up at the top if you want to bring them back down that'd be great thank you all for coming appreciate it yeah.